welcome. We have started uh, learning about the principles and analysis of the various types of refrigeration and liquefaction cycles. So, this is now the second in the series that we shall be learning about the principle and performance of the parameters of um, uh, gas liquefaction and the factors affecting gas liquefaction, isenthalpic expansion, inversion temperature, inversion curve and the adiabatic expansion. So, first we see the gas liquefaction, again I shall not be going into detail of the uh, derivations which are available in any standard thermodynamics book or the differences I have given at the end of the lecture. So, here I shall be just highlighting the salient features and the uh, equations which are needed for the analysis. So, the liquefaction unlike the refrigeration is an open system and here we have seen what is open system that some mass is coming and uh, this part of this mass will be liquefied. So, this mass will be coming and some of it is liquefied. So, we find that this becomes open because if, if I say closed system that means nothing can go out of the system. So, it becomes closed system. So, the open system and the ideal liquefaction is based on Carnot cycle uh, using reversible isothermal compression and reversible isentropic uh, or adiabatic expansion. And here we find that very high pressure is needed to liquefy the gas if we use isothermal compression and this pressure is about 17 to 80 giga Pascal and giga Pascal is 10 to the power 9 Pascal is 1 giga Pascal. So, we need very very high uh, pressure uh, for uh, if we want to convert the gas into the liquid isothermal by um, compression. So, it is not uh, feasible because there is no compressor which can generate such high amount of pressure. So, uh, but this is ideal uh, process cycle and ideal process is never used in practice. So, here first let us understand the process. Here we have the total mass which is going into the compressor and this Q dot presents the heat of compression that is rejected to keep the compression isothermal and then this compressed mass is taken here and is expanded and we are getting out some work if we are using term turbine and then finally, we find that we get some kind of liquefaction here and here this F represents the uh, liquid portion out of this thing. So, this is how this liquefaction works and if we are making this uh, looking putting the temperature entropy diagram, we start with some uh, particular state 1 here and then we, when we move on the left side from right, we are increasing the pressure. Uh, and then it is this pressure is increased isothermally and this P2 is selected so that the gas will become a liquid on expansion. So, that is how we are uh, putting this thing and then what will happen that now we are expanding it. So, you can see that if we uh, go to some other pressure on the left hand side, we can also go here and if we say I compress up to this, then in, then I expand it here, I will never reach the uh, liquid side. So, we have to see that whenever this dome is there, we have to cross this dome to ensure that on the isentropic expansion, this gas is converted to liquid. That is why we need such a high pressure. Okay. So, that is and, uh, and then once we go to this pressure and then we uh, come to this and this is isentropic expansion and this work produced is H2 minus HF. This H2 minus HF is the work produced. So, this is how the ideal cycle uh, ideal liquefaction is represented on a TS diagram and if we apply the first law of thermodynamics on this particular um, cycle, we find this is how we will get the ideal work needed and this MF is per unit mass of the amount liquefied. This MF is the amount this out of this total M dot MF is uh, liquefied this MF and this is coming as T into SI S1 minus SF minus H n minus H f. So, this is how in terms of the temperature and the entropy and the enthalpy, we are getting the ideal work. Now, there are various performance parameters used for this uh, liquefaction systems and one is this work required for unit mass gas compressed. So, here we are representing a total work required and this total work required um, may be the if I suppose we are not taking the turbine work to run the compressor, then this work will be representing the work we are inputting 
uh, for the compressor and if we are taking the work from the turbine and putting it to the compressor then it will mean the net work which is inputted externally in in addition to the work obtained from the turbine okay so that is how we are talking about the work required for the unit mass of gas compressed and this is the m dot is the total mass of the gas which is going into the system there is another parameter that is the work required for unit mass of gas liquefied so this is compressed and liquefied so this is the amount which is getting liquefied out of this amount so again we can represent this is another way of representing the process performance and thirdly is the fraction of the total mass that got liquefied we call it yield so yield is defined as the amount that has gone into liquid phase and divided by the total amount that has been taken into the system and these two works can be represented easily you can see this if you put this definition over here then you can see that this work amount this work that is needed for unit mass of the gas compressed is equal to the product of the yield and the amount of the work per unit mass of the gas liquefied now this why we are putting negative because the net work has to be given to the system okay so that means whenever we have work is done on the system in thermodynamics we use the convention that we put the work as negative and when the work is produced by the system we put as positive so in this particular thing we have net work has to be given to the system so it is negative suppose in case of turbine the work is positive because turbine is producing the work and then uh, we are um, uh, putting the figure of merit by comparing the actual work needed and the ideal work that is calculated so this is how we are getting the actual work needed per unit mass of the uh, unit mass of the gas liquefied and the uh, ideal work needed for the unit mass of the gas uh, liquefied in an ideal system what in the ideal system the whole gas is liquefied that means we are not leaving any gas unliquefied so in that case what happens is mf is become equal to m dot and then y becomes 100% but this is never achieved and are not also needed in practice now in this particular table what we are showing that we are showing that depending on the type of gas we are showing that how much work ideal work this w is ideal work how much ideal work per unit mass of the gas liquefied is needed for the gas liquefaction at this particular temperature and the pressure now you see that with temperature pressure as we have seen that this h1 value s1 value hf sf this all these h values change with temperature so we find this these things that uh, for the various types of gases because this enthalpy and entropy values depend on the type of the substance so we find that we are getting the difference uh, different types of ideal work and we find that here this hydrogen is needing the greatest amount of work whereas we find that this nitrogen air they have and this argon is still quite less so that is why we find that the uh, cost of hydrogen production is also quite high rather than this one from the compression point of view and here we have the various factors which affect the uh, performance parameters of the liquefaction cycle because in the cycle we have found that we have the uh, compressors we have heat exchangers so all individual equipment how good uh, how well they are working they also dictate the overall performance of the system so here we say that the adiabatic efficiency of compression expander then mechanical efficiencies of the compression expander and the heat exchanger efficiencies then we have we assume that there is no pressure drop in the pipelines and if there but in reality we find there will be some finite pressure drop in the pipelines heat exchangers and the various types of fittings valves etc we are using and then th there could be you know, some heat transfer between the systems and the surroundings even though we try to ensure that there is no heat ex exchange between system surroundings by providing insulation but there is no perfect insulation so whatever insulation we are using we will find that however small but some finite amount of heat exchange will always always be there heat exchange means that it could be either from the system to the ambient or ambient into the system so both ways it can take place and these factors are not only uh, dictating the liquefaction performance but they also dictate 
the refrigeration performance because in the refrigeration cycles also we are using all these compressors, expanders, heat exchangers, pipelines, valves, etc. Now, let us come to uh, ways of the producing the low temperature and uh, this is also true for the refrigeration cycle. So, here we find that the low temperature first we learn about the Joule Thomson effect and in this uh, means that in this we are using some kind of expansion valve to carry out the Joule Thomson expansion. So, if we neglect the kinetic and the potential energy changes and we assume that there is no heat exchange between the system and the surroundings that is it is uh, completely adiabatic process and there is no shaft work involved that is the system is not producing any work. Then if we apply the first law of thermodynamics across the expansion device then we will get what that we will get as H 1 is equal to H 2 that is the enthalpy at the inlet is equal to enthalpy at the outlet. And even though the in the within the valve the flow is irreversible and it is not isentropic. So, there is all irreversibility inside the valve, but uh, on the outside we are getting it to be an isenthalpic process. Now, due to this expansion what happens? There will be some change in the temperature and this change the temperature may either uh, increase or it may decrease. So, this particular change in the temperature due to the change in the pressure is given by some parameter which is called the Joule Thomson coefficient by mu and this J t is Joule Thomson and this Joule Thomson coefficient is defined like this that how the pressure uh, pressure change affects the temperature change keeping the enthalpy constant. So, we are assuming isenthalpic process because of the H 1 equal to H 2. So, dou t by dou p at constant uh, enthalpy. So, this is the uh, coefficient of expansion for Joule Thomson effect. And again without de deriving any this thing we can uh, find out that for the ideal gas this value of the mu j t is equal to 0 and mu j t equal to 0 means we will not be able to change the temperature of the uh, fluid if we change the pressure. Okay. So, that means it is unaffected by the change in the pressure in this case expansion. Now, if that that is the case if we are not able to generate any temperature change that would mean that any ideal gas will not be suitable to produce cooling or refrigeration. Okay. So, we do not want the gas to behave ideally uh, under the given condition uh, because it will not be able to generate the low temperature and uh, fortunately under the cryogenic conditions because cryogenic means very low temperature under cryogenic conditions all the gases will behave non ideally and that is why we will be able to produce some amount of refrigeration by using any of the cryogenic gases. Now, let us look into this isenthalpic expansion a bit more. So, as I said that due to the expansion depending on the value of the mu j t the gas may either get heated up or it may get cooled down. Okay. Now, for to know that uh, means how it will be. So, let us see the in, uh, inversion temperature. So, this is the temperature at a given enthalpy that expansion below which will produce cooling and above which will cause heating. So, if we on this temperature versus pressure diagram we put these are various lines of constant enthalpy. Okay. So, if we choose any any enthalpy randomly suppose I choose this isenthalpic curve okay. and in this particular curve we find there is a certain temperature if we are expand if we have the gas initially at this particular in this region and if we are going for any kind of um, expansion we will find it is always we going to raise the um, temperature. On the other hand if you go below it we will find that it is going to uh, lower the temperature. So, we would always like to operate the particular uh, expansion below this particular temperature. So, we will find that this temperature this particular temperature is the inversion temperature and this inversion temperature will be changing with the different enthalpies. So, that is what you say the temperature at which at a given enthalpy and the expansion below which will produce cooling and above which will cause heating. And as we it is experimentally found that as we um, change this enthalpy the this temperature uh, will be first 
increasing and then decreasing with decrease in the enthalpy. And what happens that um, uh, it reaches certain maximum. So, that is the maximum inversion temperature for that particular gas. So, we must always make sure that we are always below the maximum inversion temperature whenever we want to have some refrigeration. And this inversion temperature may be more or less than the ambient. So, for some gases if the inversion temperature is less than ambient temperature then we first we need to cool down the gas and then carry out expansion. Okay? But if the inversion temperature is more than the uh, ambient temperature then we need not need any kind of pre cooling. So, then the, we have inversion uh, curves and what are these curves? These are locus of the inversion temperatures at different enthalpies. So, this particular curve which is joining the inversion temperature at different enthalpies, this is the inversion curve, the locus of the uh, inversion temperatures and this expansion valve should be operated below this inversion temperature in liquefaction or refrigeration. So, that is the importance of knowing the inversion temperature and inversion curve. And here we can see that when there is a heating, this mu j t will be less than 0 and when it is cooling, it is mu j t will be more than 0 and as you can see from the definition of the mu j t. And here we find that, that this maximum inversion temperatures uh, determined by from whether liquefaction of a gas can be done only with j t effect or would need pre cooling or expansion engines. So, this is what saying that it will depend on the inversion temperature and this, this isenthalpy expansion works on the internal work method that is there is no shaft work involved that means, we cannot get any useful work that can be used for driving some other devices. So, it is only internally there is a work happening and this internal work is basically that they are moving the uh, uh, molecules apart uh, during the expansion and this may or may not result in cooling. And in this particular table, we find for the different types of gases, we have the this in maximum inversion temperature. And here we see that like helium, hydrogen, neon, the this maximum temperature is less than the uh, ambient temperature. So, for these gases, we need to cool down the pre cool the gases before expanding them if you want cooling. But on the other hand nitrogen, air, carbon monoxide, argon, oxygen, methane, carbon dioxide, ammonia, we find their inversion maximum inversion temperatures are way above the ambient temperatures. So, that means, we do not need to pre-cool these gases um, before we take them for expansion to produce cooling. So, this is that is the importance of knowing this maximum inversion temperature. Next uh, way that is another way of uh, producing the cold is adiabatic expansion and in this this adiabatic expansion produces some external work which may be used for, for driving some other machines. Okay? And if the expansion is reversible and adiabatic, that means it is not just adiabatic but also reversible. In that case we get the maximum work and when we maximize the work we get the maximum cooling and this kind of system which is reversible and as well as adiabatic is called isentropic expansion. So, in this case also we define another kind of expansion coefficient that is called the isentropic expansion coefficient and is defined as the similar manner that here we are instead of j t we are using s to represent uh, the equal, equal uh, um, entropy before and after the expansion. And here we are defining similar fashion to mu j t dou t by dou p, but instead of h we are writing s. Okay? So, this is the difference and it can be also derived and shown that for ideal gas this mu s is equal to v that is the specific volume and the specific heat. Now, here it is something different from the uh, joule Thomson effect. In joule Thomson for the ideal gases it was coming to 0 but in this case it is non-zero and this shows that isentropic expansion will always lead to cooling whether the gas is real or gas is ideal. It does not matter every time it will be producing cooling and why because this cooling is dependent on external work method and because um, it is generating work which can be used to drive some other machines and that is why 
the isentropic expansion will always, always lead to better cooling than the isenthalpic expansion valve. Now, here is a comparison between the expansion valve and the adiabatic expansion for producing the cold. First is that in this expansion valve it may cool down or it may heat up after expansion depending on whether the gas is below or uh, above uh, below or above the inversion temperature, but adiabatic expansion will always lead to cooling. And this does not change the temperature of ideal gas in expansion. So, ideal gases will remain the temperature will remain unchanged for ideal gases, but ideal gases undergo cooling on expansion adiabatically. Then this is based on the internal work that is only the molecules are separated, but this is based on the external work which may be used to drive a machine. So, for example, a compressor and then this can handle two phases liquid and vapor phases and hence used for final liquefaction, but this adiabatic expansion is so generally they cannot handle two phases even though some expanders this uh, uh, this turbines are also being designed for handling two phases in general they cannot handle two phases because the turbine run at a very high speed so any kind of liquid will damage the blades of the turbine so that is not used so that is the limitation of using the adiabatic expansion for liquefaction so what happens this adiabatic expanders are generally used to pre cool the gases before it is taken for the expansion valve for isenthalpic expansion to produce the liquefaction so that is how these two both these types of uh, expansion devices are used and these are the references which you may refer to for further detail and the derivations of the various types of equations I have shown you in this particular lecture. Thank you.